Sometimes even good people can make a mistake. And when it happens, it's one of the most intense and emotional experiences of your life. It could be a DUI, or maybe you were in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps you just did something stupid at the spur of the moment without even thinking, and now you're in trouble with the law. Well, you need experienced legal help right away so you don't become a victim of the criminal justice system. Even good people can make a mistake, and if you, a friend or a loved one, has been accused of a crime, don't make another mistake by hiring the wrong attorney for the kind of help you need. You need to visit ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's ToddJohnsLaw.com, and then call Attorney Todd Johns today. Attorney Todd Johns has decades of experience helping good people like you who have made mistakes or bad decisions and will stand by you every step of the way. ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's Enough Out of You is also sponsored by Case Quattro Winery, featuring over 20 flavors of wine from dry red, dry white, and fruit for your sampling pleasure. Case Quattro Winery offers entertainment, parties, and private events. Now serving a full menu with a little something for everyone, including appetizers, salads, dinners, pizza, and desserts. Case Quattro has some of the best live entertainment in the area with comedy and karaoke nights and live bands. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all of our upcoming events. And if you mention the code OUTA, that's O-U-T-T-A, you get 15% off of your order. Located on Main Street in Peckville, Pennsylvania, call 570-382-3855 for more information. And we thank Case Quattro Winery for their support. All right. Hello and welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I am your host, Bill Rader, and joining me, as he always does, is my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, how's it going this week? Hey, Billy Braves. How you doing, my man? I'm doing pretty good. I know we got uh, a lot going on this week, and uh, it's Easter weekend as is uh, when we're recording, so... You know, a lot of a lot of stuff going on, but family stuff and things like that. How about you? You got a lot of a lot, lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot of running around today. Uh, Going to go yeah. see Godzilla later, and you know, yeah. Easter dinner tomorrow. But uh, before we get to our great guest, just want to talk about you know, there was a tragedy in uh, Northeast PA this this past week. Uh, a friend of mine and a local businessman, uh, Brian Nardella, was killed in a car accident. Uh, Brian was the owner of uh, Loyalty Barbershop. And it's just a, it's just an awful tragedy, Billy. You know, I, everybody knew him. I mean, my cousin Pat and him were best of friends and he was just really a great guy, Billy. He was one of those guys that, that rare person that, you know, got along with everybody, everybody liked him, and right. he never had a bad word to say about anybody and everybody respected him and something that's lacking in this world, you know, and, and the, the word right. loyalty barbershop, I mean, it meant something because every time. He went in there. He was so humble and, and appreciate your business. You know, as soon as I'd walk in, I'd see him smiling. And and then he'd say, uh, you know, have a seat, brother. And then he would, he'd ask about the family. And then, uh, you know, he'd quickly start talking about pro wrestling, you know, going back to the, the right. old school days. And he was just a huge wrestling fan and just a great guy, Billy. And it's a loss to the community because he built up such an iconic uh uh, business over there, you know, in yeah. Archibald. And it's just, you know, it's just shocked everybody to know him and, and everybody in, in the area, you know, it's just terrible. So, yeah. you know, my heart goes out to his family and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a loss that that's tragic, Billy. Young, young guy. Was he 40, 48, 49, 49? Billy? Yeah. yeah. 49. Yeah. Way yeah. too young. Way too yeah, young. I, I didn't know him, but you know, I see tributes to him all, all uh, on Facebook and everything. Just oh, it's seemed, incredible the tributes. Seemed like a great, seemed like a great guy. So, uh, like everybody that ever met him, Billy. Yeah, you know, you couldn't help not to like the guy. Yeah, just one of those guys that just respected everybody, and everybody respected him. He was just great guy, and he just died way too young. 
Uh, well, it just goes to show you, you never know. You never know when, you know, you wake up and it's going to be it. That's going to be your last day. You just got to enjoy every day. And as uh, Warren Zevon said, enjoy every sandwich. Yeah, life is too short. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, let's get to our guest, Billy. All right. Well, let's get to our guest because um, we are thrilled to have her back. I think this is like her third or fourth appearance on our podcast. Monica Wiesack rejoins us. Monica, welcome back. Hi. Hey, thank you for having me back. It's great to be back with you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. Great to have you back. And we're, we've got you this time because of your uh, your new book that, that you put out, uh, Michael Jackson, The Man, The Music, The Controversy. Um, I, Monica, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I know Sean has read it, so Sean's gonna gonna have a ton of questions. But I'm gonna have like an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, for you uh, for for questions and stuff like that. So, Sean, let's. I know you got a whole list of questions you want to ask Monica. Let's let's get started with that. Yeah. Well, first of all, Monica, the, the book is tremendous. It's called Michael Jackson: The Man, The Music, The Controversy. Uh, you can get it on our bookshop. It's up there now. Um, it's just a tremendous book. And the first thing I want to ask you, Monica, is is why why were you compelled to write it? What was the reasons that that you had to write this book? So I've been a big MJ fan since I was a little kid. And a lot of sort of what I learned about the world, he um I learned from him, or he kind of um had a lot of influence on my views as they developed. Um, so I first sort of I consciously remember being introduced to him with the man in the mirror song and the man in the mirror music video. And I was just so inspired by that song as a child, because, you know, he was basically telling me not to forget about the people that are typically forgotten by society and to sort of, you know, have empathy for, for people, have compassion for people and to sort of realize if you want to make the world a better place, you need to do it yourself. And he actually had images of JFK and RFK in that music video he did for that song. So he also introduced me to JFK. I think right. that was my first or one of my first introductions into JFK. Um, and he also had an autobiography out at that time, which um, Jackie Kennedy did the introduction to that. And she actually edited his autobiography. And in that autobiography, you know, he wrote that the whole philosophy behind Man in the Mirror was the same philosophy that JFK had you know, ask not what your country can do or not ask not what um, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Right. So um, and then after that song, a couple of years after that, he came out with a dangerous album where he had like black or white and heal the world. And I was really inspired by that as well, because in the heal the world video, you sh he shows all these war torn regions you know, from Africa to Asia to Israel and Palestine. Right. And he shows the kids playing without prejudice. And so when the soldiers see the kids playing, they lay down their weapons because um, they're like, well, you know, kids don't have prejudice. You, they sort of is how the world should be in a way, if that makes sense. And like, you know, he was conveying that a lot of the tension in these regions is due to, you know, adults and their prejudice and their greed and whatever, but that's not the way the world needs to be. And I know that's very utopian and unrealistic, but as a child, those sorts of images impact you and influence you. And so after that, in 1993, um, came out the allegations, the molestation charges. And I remember when those hit, I was just sort of like, what is going on here? Because there were a lot of false rumors about him constantly. And, you know, I knew even the late 80s, early 90s, there was constantly, you know, crap printed about him in the press. So when the molestation allegations came, it just seemed like another kind of false story. But the press was taking it really seriously. Right. Um, and of course, the police got involved in all that. And so I just remember finding it very strange. And obviously, I didn't know at the time. Much later in life, I went back to research it once you had the Internet and you could you know, easily access court papers and things like that. At the time, I obviously didn't know definitively anything because all I knew was what was in the press. But I could see right away that it was very slanted. So it was in a way sort of my first introduction to propaganda in a way, because, you know, I'm still a kid. I'm not really paying attention to the news and the wars and, you know, all the kind of horrible things happening around the world. So yeah. my first introduction to propaganda in a way was the way they handled Michael and the way they handled those allegations, because um, I could kind of see that it wasn't 
it wasn't right the way they were handling it. I didn't know what the truth was, but I knew the way it was presented was to push a certain agenda. Um, and then in response to that, he came out with a history album and he titled the first or he uppercased the first three letters to imply that history is his story. So history depends on who tells it. Right. So that to me was really jarring as well as a kid, because that really resonated with me as in, in terms of, you know, what we're told are stories. And they say, you know, history is told by the victors or is written by the victors, so to speak. And so he's kind of implying that there's a different side of the story to not just his story, but to really a lot of things that we're told. And in that album, he got even much bolder with songs like They Don't Care About Us. He actually wrote a song about the JFK assassination on that album, both character and physical assassination. So I think that was the first time that I think was seeped into my subconscious, the idea that JFK was character assassinated. Um, right. You know, and I think I got that from Michael because I must have listened to that song like a million times when I was young. Um, and there was just, and even in the They Don't Care About Us video, you know, he shows um, Lee Harvey Oswald being shot by Jack Ruby. And he shows all these atrocities from human history. And he's basically saying those in power don't care about the rest of humanity and will use like divide and conquer tactics, you know, to separate humanity. Um, and so I learned a lot from him, you know, growing up. And then, of course, you had that horrible trial in 2005, which, again, the press coverage was just so horrid. And even then, right. I still didn't really know what was going on because, um, you know, I was busy with my life. I wasn't like looking at court papers or anything like that. So I didn't really know exactly what was going on. But I knew the press coverage was very biased. That much I could pick up on. And so... You know, and then when he passed after he passed away, that's when I really started looking at it more in depth. And I actually went back and like I looked at the court papers and everything like that. And I was just blown away by how railroaded he was and how little I really understood about those cases, even as a fan, even as someone that um, was skeptical of it and knew that it was very one sided, the coverage. I still had no idea as to actually what happened with him and what happened with those allegations. And so when I learned about it, I was just so blown away at how little I even as a fan knew about it and understood about it and how I think obvious it is once you look at it, um, you know, that he was railroaded. Mm -hmm. And so after I wrote my JFK book, I just like as soon as I finished my JFK book, I knew I wanted to tell his story because I felt it was a story that really needed to be told. And that even a lot of casual fans don't really understand his story, let alone the wider general public. Um, and so I thought it was an important story to tell. And also in the sense that I think we don't consider how controlled Hollywood is and how controlled the entertainment industry is. And we think of, um, you know, we think of those in power, you know, who might push imperialism or wars or whatever, you know, we know that they lie about a lot of things, but I don't think we think about how controlled the entertainment industry is and how controlled the music industry is. Sure. Because you don't necessarily want an artist like Michael singing anti-war no. songs or singing songs like They Don't Care About Us, or even songs like Man in the Mirror that really, you know, encourage people to have compassion and empathy towards others. Those aren't the songs you really want society focusing on, if that makes sense. And so... Um, I think it's just a fascinating insight into how the entertainment industry works. And, you know, I can't say definitively why he was targeted, but I think it's a fair question to ask, sure. you know, did it have anything to do with, you know, the kind of messages and themes he was promoting in his music? Well, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about the control over Hollywood, because that that's so true. And you you see that with, with, you know, look what happened to Oliver Stone when he when he came out with the JFK movie. I mean, he was treated awful in the press. And, um, you know, he, he was like treated like a pariah after that movie. And it was so unfair when you look at that compared to other movies that were based on historic events that are so inaccurate. I mean, I could just go through a million of them, um, you know, so so you have that. But the one thing about the book, and I really never realized how Michael Jackson and Meyer JFK and RFK and MLK. And I never really, you know, put that connection to, to his music and his activism and, and all that. And your book really brings that out. And it's such an incredible connection to, to Kennedy. It's really amazing. And, and, you know, it's, it just seems that 
celebrities and, and musicians and, and actors and stuff and people that try to make a difference and try to be for peace and try to be for, you know, the activism and stuff, it seems to never end well with them. So it seems like they always are targeted, whether it's character assassination or, you know, just assassination. Yeah, no, I agree. And he actually had a painting of JFK at his house in Neverland. Wow. Um, yeah, so I definitely, definitely a lot of my interest in JFK came from him because I was a huge fan of, of Michael and he was a huge fan of JFK. So obviously when you're a fan of someone, you kind of want to know, well, who are they a fan of, you know? Sure. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of my interest in JFK, I think came from Michael growing up for sure. Well, let's, let's go through the book, Billy, do you have any questions before we start going through it? So just real quick, Monica, the, the, um, and I'm sure you talk about this quite a bit in the book, but the, that, um, the trial was, it was a civil trial, right? It wasn't a criminal trial. Uh, no, there was, uh, it gets, it's actually kind of complicated in 1993, they were pursuing both simultaneously a criminal and a civil. And then in 2005, it was civil or sorry, criminal 2005 was criminal. Oh, it was a criminal trial. Yes. Yes, they okay. tried to send him to prison, and and I can go into details on that trial if you'd like, or I don't yeah, know what questions like you have to, prepared, but right. yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'd like to go through that, but I'd like to go like the order of the book, though. Um, that sounds so good. So let, let's start at the, the beginning, you know, the star is born, and, and talk about Michael at an early age, and then, you know, you could talk about how he gets into, like, superstardom with, you know, the Thriller album in, in 19, 1982. Yeah, so he um, sang publicly for the first time in the first grade when he was like five or six years old. And he, you know, blew everyone away with his voice because he had this really magical voice when he was young. And he lived, he grew up in a really, in Gary, Indiana, which is about 30 miles southeast of Chicago. And it's a really rough town, a really rough neighborhood, you know, so he grew up in poverty in a big family. And when his father saw that his sons had a lot of talent, he wanted to um, get them to sort of focus on that talent and to stay away from like the gangs and the drugs and, you know, the, the crime in the neighborhood and whatnot, and really focus on trying to make it as musicians. And Michael's brothers were a bit older, you know, they were like in their preteens by this point, um, or maybe even in their teens, and Michael was five. And so for the next five years or so, or the next four or five years, they basically um, performed like constantly, like on a lot of nights after school, they rehearsed or they went to clubs to perform. They went to talent shows and the clubs they went to, you know, sometimes it was even strip clubs, you know. So Michael was sort of introduced to an adult world at a much younger age than he was comfortable being introduced into that adult world. Because obviously, if you're performing at a strip club or something, you see a lot of things that a six, seven, eight year old shouldn't be seeing. Um and so he didn't really have a childhood. He wasn't famous yet at that age, but he was working 24 seven and he was working in an adult world. Um, and then when he was around 10 or 11, they um, went to audition for Motown, which was a major record label. And Barry Gordy, who was like the head of Motown was just blown away by the audition. And he was blown away by the empathy in Michael's voice. Um, so he felt like Michael could sing songs and convey emotions in a way that, you know, someone who maybe had 50 years life experience should be able to convey, but not in a way that you would expect a 10 year old to convey emotion and empathy in his voice. So that's what Barry Gordy was really blown away, not just like the technical aspects of his voice, but the emotion in his voice. So he signed them to a recording contract, the brothers, the Jackson five, and they, um, their first four songs were all number one hits. Um, you know, these are songs probably a lot of people grew up with. And they came out, I think 1969 was the first, their first number one hit, if I remember correctly. And then uh, they had a few more in the early 70s. His brothers kept making albums actually until the mid 1980s. But at the same time, and starting in like the early mid 70s, Michael started doing solo albums. Um, even as a kid, as like a preteen, he was doing solo albums. Uh, while at the same time doing albums with his brothers and performing with his brothers, um, and then 1979, I think, was when Off the Off the Wall came out. And that was his first solo album as an adult. And that was a really successful album. Um, but it wasn't until 1982's Thriller that he really catapulted to like mega superstardom. Um, because that album, I think to this day, is still the greatest selling album of all time. Right. And it just spawned like hit after hit after hit, you know, and every uh, song on that album is great. Um 
So that's mm-hmm. really what um, really ca- catapulted him to that superstardom. But even by that point, you know, he's been performing since he was five years old. So he is like a seasoned professional by the time, sure. you know, Thriller comes out. Yeah. And Monica, just to add, add a little bit of maybe uh, color into that, I was 10 when that album came out. So I was really just kind of getting into music. And um, that was the, one of the first records I ever bought. And I probably I probably wore <laughs> wore the vinyl out. I listened to it so many times. Um, I just uh, loved it. And, you know, if you were, um, if you were, uh, you know, at that age at that time, or, you know, even a little bit older, um, just everything, you know, the, the music videos, everything about that record was, was unbelievable. And, and Sean, I, I'm, I'm sure you remember the thriller video. Oh, sure. Um, Absolutely. You know, when that, when that, I mean, that was an event when it came on MTV, mm-hmm. that was just a video. That was an event. Like people gathered around the TV to watch that. It was amazing. I can remember, um, you know, being being at our house and somebody saying, oh, you know, Thriller's coming on, Thriller's coming. We would literally, the whole family would sit in front of the TV and wait for that that video to come on. It was such such an amazing, uh, you know, spectacle. It was incredible. And I mean, he was just, you couldn't get bigger than Michael Jackson. He was the biggest star in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. So then, Monica, we have... In 1984, we have an accident that uh, really alters his his life trajectory. Um, and the media would go on attack about him bleaching his skin, and then later on, the, the term "wacko jacko" would be used by the media. Uh, why don't you get into that a little bit? Yeah, so 1984, when filming a commercial, commercial, he suffered a horrific burns on his scalp. I mean, it's like, if you look at the photos online, it it just looks brutal. Like it looks like the sun, like his scalp is the sun. It just, you make, you know, makes you want to puke. So I can't even imagine or fathom the pain he was in. Um, and so that introduced him to painkillers for the first time in his life. So that is one impact it had on his life. Um, but burns are also a leading cause of vitiligo. So vitiligo is a disease that causes you to lose the pigmentation of your skin. And you can see in the mid-1980s, he starts to lose pigmentation in his skin. Um, now, vit- vitiligo kind of it happens in patches. And so a lot of times makeup is used to even out the skin. So you can actually see many times he's wearing heavy makeup on his face and whatnot to even out his skin so that it looks kind of more natural. Um, but he actually, there are a lot of photos you can find online these days where you can see the blotches on his skin. And he also had lupus, which was, he was diagnosed with in 1983. And lupus is also a leading cause of vitiligo. Um, and lupus is a lot of times aggravated when you're performing under things like harsh, um, harsh artificial lights, which he'd been performing under since he was five years old. So I think it's the combination of the burns and the lupus that likely led to his vitiligo. I can't say for certain. You know, I obviously don't have access to his medical records, although there are um, multiple doctors of his who have testified under oath that he had vitiligo. And he was um, his autopsy autopsy report also indicated he had vitiligo. So I don't think there's any doubt that he had vitiligo. And certainly the burns, I think, if they didn't cause it, then they aggravated, you know, an ascent case of vitiligo um, because you can just look at that timeline. That's really when he started to lose the pigmentation of his skin. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It was a slow process. But by the early 1990s, you can see he's got almost no pigmentation left in his skin. And that's why you see him going to like lighter and lighter and lighter makeup starting in the mid eighties until the early 1990s where he's, you know, kind of given up on trying to darken his skin. Um, And so I think that was really traumatic for him to go through that, you know, because he was a really self-conscious guy when he was young, you know, people, a lot of people made fun of his looks constantly, you know, he had a lot of acne and he was also, um, I think really sub subconscious about it or conscious about it, self-conscious about it. Because when he was a little kid, you know, he was this like cute little kid. And then when people, when he was like 14, 15 and people would see him and he did introduce himself as Michael or somebody would say, there's Michael. And then somebody else would say, no, that's not Michael, you know, because he was starting to look really different than when he looked as a kid. So I think a lot of that, and I think also pressure maybe from the industry and his father and whatever, you know, I think he wasn't really self-conscious about his look. So then when you add vitiligo on top of that, I think that probably made him even more self-conscious about his appearance and more sort of, um, 
I guess, you know, gave him a hard time over that. And then in the mid 1980s is when all the wacko Jacko stuff started as well. Right. Um, and Jacko was actually East London, East London slang for monkey. Um, so, you know, you have to ask, you know, why they chose that word. Um, and that's really, that started with a London tabloid. That's where that wacko Jacko term started. Mm. And so in the mid 1980s, the stories were kind of absurd and silly, but they weren't yet, um, you know, we didn't, they didn't, the molestation stuff didn't happen until 93. So the press got way, way harsher towards him, you know, later on. But even in the early, uh, sorry, even in mid late 80s, you can start to see that trend forming where there's a lot of harshness by the press towards him. Right. And he was starting to become a little more conscious in, in his music. Um, like he wrote, We Are the World. I think it was in 1985. You know, there's Man in the Mirror. So they aren't as bold as the songs later, like on his history album, but they're still starting. You're promoting, you know, peace and unity. And you're starting to get into trends that maybe the music industry isn't as crazy about. And I actually recounted a story in my book um, where Rupert Murdoch, you know, basically, or within his companies, you know, an employee was saying, we have a memo from the top that we're supposed to rubbish Michael Jackson every chance we get in our papers. Not you know, surprising. and if there's nothing that's actually happened that we can rubbish him with, we have to make it up. Huh. Um, and so you can see right there um, that the press is going after him and it's very top down. So I'm not saying that there aren't reporters at the lower levels that were driving it too, obviously, but it's also very clear that it's very top down. Um, that this is this um, sure. desire or these instructions sort of to smear him are coming from the top of these um, media companies. And so you have to wonder why, you know, some people say it's just profit. I think that's a simplistic way to look at it, because I think the records show that positive Michael Jackson stuff sells way more than negative Michael Jackson stuff. I mean, you know, you just like you said, with Thriller, mm -hmm. you know, the positive stuff sells great. So I don't think it's profit why he was smeared. And so I try to raise the question in my book just to get people thinking about it again. Like, you know, is what is an artist allowed to say? And if you get an artist that's promoting messages that you don't, you know, that the quote unquote empire doesn't want to promote, you know, is that artist going to be smeared and derailed? Right. And, and you know, try to reduce their influence on society. Right. And one of the things you mentioned in the book, uh, Monica, that, you know, Michael Jackson had a huge white audience, which, you know, um, that, you know, we see that in other singers like Bob Marley who had a huge white audience that makes them a target for, you know, intelligence uh, agencies that go after them because they see that as a threat. And, and you'll, you'll even see that with black activists like, say, um, Freddie Hampton, who you know, was such a threat to Jagger Hoover because of his Rainbow Coalition, where he's trying to unite, you know, young white kids and young uh, Puerto Rican kids. And and to them, that's a threat. So, so the fact that Michael Jackson had such a huge white audience, it makes him a threat to people who, who want to keep the people divided. Yeah. And I wouldn't even say white. I would say a huge global audience. Like he True. had a huge audience in Europe and North America and South America and Asia and Africa. I don't think there's ever been an artist that ha that has had that global of an audience. Like the Beatles were popular, but they weren't popular in South America and Africa and Asia like right. they were in Europe and America. You know, I'm not sure there's any artist that's had that global of an audience. And you think about an artist singing so songs like Heal the World and They Don't Care About Us, and you have people on every continent listening to those songs and sort of unifying and listening to his unifying messages that's not what you want as an empire. No, especially when you're running Intel operations, you know, basically taking over these countries. The last thing you want is somebody singing, you know, about peace and, and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. So then the, um, the next chapter we talk about, you talk about in the book, you know, Michael the man and how the media image of him, you know, is not realistic. And then you, you talked about how people who, who really knew him how they actually viewed them. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So everybody, I must have listened to interviews of like a hundred people that either worked for him or worked with him. And this is both like on music or at his ranch or wherever it may be. And they all give a very, very consistent portrayal of him. You know, they all said he was super sweet, super kind, you know, was very 
cautious about hurting anyone's feelings, like just a really sweet, kind person, um, really curious person. A lot of people said he was super curious. And Michael said that about himself, you know, that what interests him most about life is learning about new things. Um, you know, so he was really inquisitive. He was quite a bookworm. Um, he was quite nerdy in a lot of ways. You know, he loved to read. He would just drag boxes and boxes of books everywhere. Um, he had a massive library at Neverland. Um, you know, and he was an extremely hard worker. Like he was just really, really hardworking, you know, really dedicated to his music. He was also a prankster. You know, he loved to play jokes on people, but, you know, like lighthearted jokes, not mean spirited, but just, you know, teasing people here and there and just, you know, being like a kid, you know, making life um, light, so to speak. And, right. and Monica, that's one of the things that you heard about him all the time was that he really just was a big kid, you know, because he, they say because he he really didn't have a childhood. He didn't have a normal upbringing. You know, he was kind of the the breadwinner from from a very young age, and so he really didn't have a chance to have you know to have friends and and ride bikes and play with you know toys and and things like that. So he kind of learned those things you know later on as as he got into his teens and twenties. Yeah, I think that played a huge part of it. But I think it was also because he was very very spiritual. And so he had a real um, tremendous respect for creation and that's for children, for nature, for really for God. Um, and I think his spirituality is part of what made him so childlike. And he spoke about that as well. Um, so I think it was the combination of him not having a childhood and him being very spiritual that made him that way. So next, yeah. oh, go ahead, Bill. You got something else? I was going to say, it, it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So next we're up to, you, you talked a little bit about this before, but we're up to the, the Bad Album and the, the song Man in the Mirror. And, you know, he references JFK and then, uh, you know, his videos start to display images, you know, historical figures that he admired, like, you know, JFK and RFK and, and Martin Luther King and, and John Lennon. And um, it's just incredible because I never made that connection, Monica, and, and you know, I was in the I I my brother was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I was more into at that time when I was young. I was into Kiss and Black Sabbath, and I, even at a young age, I was into like ACDC and bands like that. But I always had a respect for for Michael Jackson because obviously he was you know the biggest star at the time, like Billy mentioned earlier. But I never made that connection to JFK, and and your book really brings that out. Yeah, no, he he adored JFK. He really admired him. Um, you know that. I think he must have referenced JFK maybe in three or four songs of his or three or four videos of his. Um, and like I said, he had a painting of him at his house. Jackie wrote his autobiography, or not wrote, she um, edited his autobiography. Um, and he wouldn't write an autobiography unless Jackie edited it. Um, wow. And that's how that ended up happening. <laughs> you know, because people wanted him to write one. He's He, he didn't want to. He said, I'll only do it if Jackie edits it. Um so, yeah, he had a huge interest in JFK. I think he just admired, um, you know, who JFK was and the right. things he represented. Um, and that's where that came from. And you can see that, I think, Man in the Mirror and the Moonwalker book, which came out at the same time, that's the first time you're kind of introduced into his interest in J into JFK. So then he, he purchases Neverland and, um, you know, and then – was it uh, shortly after that that he, he left a Jehovah Witness? Yes, around the late 1980s, he stopped officially being a, a Jehovah Witness. So he he his mother was Jehovah Witness. She still is today. Um, she's in her 90s today. And so he grew up in that. He officially left the religion, but he was still very spiritual. And I think still, like he still referred to Jehovah God and stuff later in life. So I think he was still like one foot in the door, so to speak, even though he officially left it. And so he purchased Neverland in the late 1980s. And there's a lot of, lot of misperceptions about Neverland. Right. The first is that he did not actually live there. He did later in life, um, like in the early, by the early 2000s, he was spending more time at Neverland. But in the late 1980s through probably the late 1990s, he was only at Neverland maybe one or two weeks out of the entire year. Um, so he was rarely, wow. rarely there. Um, he actually was either traveling for work all the time or he had a condo, a two-bedroom condo in Los Angeles near recording studios where he stayed at. 
So he actually lived quite a very simplistic life in a lot of ways, because you don't think of like the biggest superstar in the world, you know, living in a two bedroom condo. I mean, it was a nice gated community condo, but, you know, you're not he wasn't living in a mansion or anything like that. And now he changed the way he lived that once he had his kids because of like security reasons and things like that. But so at Neverland, he was almost never there. And what Neverland was, and I actually didn't even know about this till like probably more than a decade after his passing, Neverland was essentially a full-time charity operation. So one to three times a week, um, except for the three winter months, but the other nine months of the year, one to three times a week, they would have a, a, invite like a group of um, either inner city children or terminally ill children or elderly people um, to spend the day at Neverland because Neverland was 3,000 acres of mostly wilderness. It was beautiful. It was right next to a national forest. So it's if you watch videos of Neverland, it's so peaceful and so serene. And there's lakes there and rolling hills and mountains and trees, like beautiful, beautiful trees. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And he did put a zoo there and an amusement park there. He did have a house there, but again, he didn't really live there till later in his life. And it was the house that came with the property. He never built a new house. It was kind of like a large rustic cabin feel to a, um, a gorgeous house. Um, but anyway, so Ch Neverland was essentially a charity operation and he had about a hundred staff there that ran mm -hmm. Neverland. Um, so there's tons of people worked at Neverland and they would do these events again, one to three times a week. And, you know, and I watched an interview or several interviews with one of the ranch managers, and he just said it was just so you could just see the impact it had on people that visited Neverland. And, sure. you know, he told a story about when these burned kids came up one day to spend the day at Neverland and they were so badly burned, you know, that they look like aliens. They didn't even look like human beings because they were just so horridly burned. And mm -hmm. and he said that day at Neverland, you know, they got to run around and play and and their chaperone said, you know, told him like how much that day meant to them because nobody was pointing fingers at them, you know, nobody was staring at them. They just got to be kids and really enjoy nature and enjoy the park. And so that's what Neverland really was. Now, Monica, my, Michael had a lot of friends that, that were young kids, um, both boys and girls. I think that, you know, it's a misconception that it was just boys. Um uh, and and some of them were you know go on like Macaulay Culkin went on to be a superstar, um, but um, why do you think he found value in in these relationships with with the young kids? Yeah, so I think it's a lot of reasons. Part of it was a lot of these relationships were in the late '80s, early '90s, and less so later in life. And I think part of it is that's where he was emotionally in life because, uh, like I said, he'd been performing since he was five. So I think he did have. And some aspects of, a, of his life, a certain stunted development, like I know one of the music executives that he worked with, um, she was told a story when Michael was 18, he would like come into her office and like dump the contents of her purse out and search through it. And she's like, you'd expect a four year old to do that, not this like genius 18 year old. Um, but right. that's, you know, where he kind of was because he didn't really play when he was younger. Um so part of it, I think, was that is that he was just emotionally at a similar level. And I know one of his um, one of the people that worked with him on his music, you know, he talked about Michael's and Lisa Marie's press, Lisa Marie Presley's relationship as like two junior hires in love. You know, he's like, that's what it was. It was like two junior hires who were crazy about each other, you know, and you think it's going to last forever, but it doesn't, you know, but that's just kind of where he was emotionally. But I think another aspect of it was, again, going back to he just loved creation, you know, and children have a certain innocence to them. And I think they inspired him to help write his music because a lot of his music is geared towards children in a lot of ways. Like when you think of Heal the sure. World, like I was saying before, when you see the soldiers lay down their guns, when they see the kids playing, you know, that's kind of geared towards an innocent audience, so to speak, or like a a utopian version of the world. And I think kids are innocent because they haven't become jaded yet. You know, they haven't been exposed to the corruption in the world yet, the greed or whatnot. And so I think that was a part of it as well. And, and I think also he wanted to mentor them because when he was little, all these adults around him were constantly mentoring him and teaching him about music, teaching him about the industry. And so he wanted to do that for younger stars as well. And a lot of these younger stars that, you know, spent time with him when they were young, you know, talked about how wonderful it was and how much they learned and how 
you know, how he right. treated them as an equal, but at the same time was able to sort of um, give them so much wisdom and advice in various areas and how much they treasure that. Monica, and of course, uh, go ahead, Billy. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about, you, you had mentioned when he was younger, he had a lot of mentors. Um, and I, I know Diana Ross was was one of those. Um, and I know he had a very, very uh, close relationship with her to the point where a lot of people speculated that a lot of his plastic surgery was so that he could kind of look more like her. What What do you know about that? Have you have you come across much of that in your research? Yeah. So he actually when they first moved to Los Angeles, they lived with Diana Ross for a while. He and his brothers, um, he actually had a massive crush on her. So I think he, he yeah. really, you know, like he's like a teenage boy and she's like a beautiful woman, you know, so like sure. I think he yeah. had a huge crush on her um, for much of his life. Um, and I think he he talked about that later, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah, I think he adored her. He definitely adored her. Um, they did have a very close relationship, you know, a good relationship. You know, she was more motherly towards him, but I right. think he definitely had a crush on her. You know, Monica, the, the media makes a big deal about, um, you know, the relationships that Michael had with these these young kids. And you talk in your book about how the head of security um, and how, you know, they were they make a big deal about how he was having them over at uh, ne Neverland and stuff. And you talk in your book about the head of security, um, how he never had any concerns um uh, about you know michael with the kids and and a lot of the staff there they never seen anything that was inappropriate or or anything like that or they didn't have any concerns about that could you talk about that yeah so yeah if you listen to the interviews from his staff like they all just speak the world of him they all really admired him as they said you know he was really humble really down to earth just an amazing person to work for and um, yeah, none of them ever had any concern about, again, Michael was virtually never even at Neverland, I guess for starters. So, but when he was there, particularly later in life, cause he was there quite a bit, like in the early 2000s and stuff and later in his right. life. Um, yeah, they said never, ever, not even the slightest concern in the world, um, you know, and their kids did visit, but it wasn't like one kid. It was like families. So people say kids, but that, that means families like Macaulay Culkin's family was there or Brett Barnes family was there. You know, you'd have a lot of families come and visit because there are three guest cottages on Neverland as well as to the uh, uh, in addition to the main house. Um, so he would and people would visit there all the time when he wasn't even there. Um, you know, like he was on, most of the time when people visited Neverland, he wasn't there. But when he was there, yeah, he would spend time with them and the kids and everybody. And again, it wasn't just boys. It was girls as well. Like Jennifer Love Hewitt, I think, told a beautiful story about, you know, her her visits to Neverland and. Um, so yeah, no, this, his staff loved him and people have to remember there's a hundred people working there. This isn't like some, you know, some guy in a house with like two staff members, like this is like right. a whole operation going on there. And there's charities there constantly every week going up there, there's schools, there's, you know, it's very well organized. It wasn't the free for all that the, the media made it out to be. Correct. And we will be right back. Are you thinking about selling your house? Well, Bob Connors, a realtor at Christian Saunders Real Estate says, I can't sell your house, but I sure as heck can market it and get it from sell to sold. Call Bob today for great marketing and to get a ton of eyeballs on your house. Are you in the market to buy a home? Not sure where to start. If it looks like something you shouldn't buy, Bob's gonna tell you that. Think you can't buy a house or have no idea where to start? Been there, done that. Bob will get you going in the right direction. You can reach Bob at 570-614-3624 or 570-335-9000. And you can find Bob on Facebook at Bob Connors Realtor. Whether you call Bob or not, please remember, stay awesome all you awesome humans and be kind to each other. Bob Connors, the realest real estater. And thanks to Bob Connors and Christian Saunders Real Estate for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. DK's Corner, located on 802 East Lackawanna Avenue in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Visit DK's Corner for hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, and delicious breakfast, including breakfast sandwiches, 
specialty coffees, and DK's Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shaken Espressos. And take it from me, the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570-209-0278 to find out about their daily specials and catering. Check out DK's Corner, Oliphant's Little Hoagie Shop, and we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. That's DK's Corner in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. So then next, you know, we get to January 31st, 1993, and, and Michael plays a, a Super Bowl performance, and he uses this performance uh, uh, to, to kind of be a unifying force. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so that actually, I remember that so vividly from when I was young. So he um, he first came out and did a medley with like Black or White and a few other songs. And then he did the Heal the World performance and he brought on people, um, children in the native wear of all their, you know, all the countries spanning the globe. And he sang Heal the World. And then he, blo- he kind of the, the earth or the globe appeared at the end. And even before that, um, he did a little part of We Are the World where everybody in the audience kind of lifted up. They lifted up a sign. And sh- so it shows sort of these children holding hands it was kind of how the audience looked like. And it was just a really beautiful, unifying, you know, song. And he introduced it saying that, you know, we don't want anyone on this planet to suffer. You know, we need to, as a, uh, as the globe really as humanity, you know, come together and make sure that we ensure that people are not suffering on this planet, um, anywhere on this planet. So it was a really, really unifying and message and just a beautiful message. And then of course the start of Michael's troubles happens and, and allegations from Evan Chandler. You want to talk about him? Yeah, so in 1990 in August 1993 the molestation allegations began and I'll kind of just take a step back a little bit. So Michael um had car troubles. I think his car ran out of gas and it ran out of gas near this place called Renarec um which he then went into for help. And Renarec was owned by David Schwartz who was married to this lady called June Chandler who had a son named Jordan and a daughter named Lily. And the son Jordan was with her ex-husband, Evan Chandler, who was a dentist, but he'd also written a screenplay, Robin Hood Men in Tights. So he was trying to kind of get himself into Hollywood and whatnot. And so Evan ends up being the father that accuses um, Michael of molesting his son. But Evan was a really absent father. He owed his wife like years of uh, child support that he hadn't paid. He rarely saw Jordy or spent time with him. But as soon as he found out that, because um, what happened was Michael went into Renarec, David Schwartz called June and Jordy down because he knew Jordy was a big fan of Michael. And that's how they met and they exchanged phone numbers. And then Michael ended up calling them and they ended up coming to Neverland. And they became friends, like genuine friends at that time, um, June and Lily and, and Michael and Jordy. And so Evan started to get jealous because he he felt like left out. And he started, suddenly started become becoming really interested in Jordy. And so he ended up meeting Michael as well. And, you know, at first Michael was kind of friendly to him, but I don't think Michael was really feeling Evan because Evan was a bit of a narcissist and he he wasn't really returning Evan's phone calls or, um, you know, paying much attention to Evan. And so Evan started to act really erratic. So David Schwartz, who was separated by from June at this point, by this point, but he decided to tape a phone call with Evan um, because he was kind of concerned about Evan's behavior. And in that phone call is really revealing because Evan is really jealous in that phone call and he's jealous that Michael's not paying attention to him. So he's like, you know, why is he not calling me? I thought we were friends. You know, I thought he liked me. So like he just sounds like a jealous ex-boyfriend or something like. um, And so he then he starts ranting and raving about how he's going to get revenge on Michael and not just Michael, but Jordy and June. He's like, I'm blaming all three of them. They're ruining my life. Um, so you can t- see he's just really erratic and jealous. And then he says, you know, they have no idea what's coming. Um, June's never going to see Jordy again. Michael's career is going to be destroyed. He's like, everything is going according to a certain plan that isn't just mine. People are lined up in certain positions. And, you know, all I have to do is pull the trigger and this guy will not sell another song. Um, so he didn't explicitly state in that phone call that he was going to accuse Michael of molesting Jordan, but it, he kind of implied it. 
And I think that's how David Schwartz interpreted it. So he went to June the next day, played the tape for her, and then they went to Anthony Pelicano, Michael's private investigator, and they gave the tape to Pelicano. And Pelicano knew right away this was an extortion attempt, um, but he went to Jordy anyway, and he asked him questions, really pointed questions. You know, has Michael ever touched you, et cetera, et cetera? And Jordy said, no, my dad just wants money. And um, so what happened then is a little bit later, um, Evan asked June for a one-week visitation with Jordy. And June obliged. And so Jordy went to stay with his father, and he never, ever went back to his mother. Um, so once, um, Evan had Jordy, he wouldn't give her back. He, he wouldn't give Jordy back to June. He went to a psychologist with a hypothetical scenario asking, um, you know, if a man is spending time with a boy, is it possible that he's abusing that boy? And then he wanted to find out how do I, uh, uh, report child abuse without liability to the parent? Um, so, you know, so how do I have report it without getting in trouble for reporting something potentially false. Um, and the psychologist said, well, if you have Jordy report it to me, or or if a child reports it to me, because this is all hypothetical at this point, then I'm obligated to report it to um, the police or, or children of family services or whatever, who then go to the police. Um, and so it's about a month passes and still Evan's not giving Jordy back to June. So June's getting really frustrated. So she goes to court and says, I want my son back. And then the next day, I think I don't think um, Evan was expecting or was planning to accuse M Michael of molestation so quickly because what's happening, I should take a step back, what's happening here is he then goes to Pelicano and Michael, Evan, with this hypothetical situation. And basically, he wants money from, from Michael, right? He's basically saying, right. if you give me money, I won't cause any uproar. I won't do anything. Just, you know, and he basically asked for $20 million. And Michael's lawyers were basically like, F off, like, um, you know, like, we're not giving you this money because Michael mm -hmm. had gotten $40 million from Sony for some like to start a film production company. And because Evan had written a screenplay, he wanted half that Sony money. So he's asking Michael for 20 million. Otherwise, I might cause you problems. And so Pelicano went to um, he wasn't serious about negotiating, but he went to talk to uh, Rothman, because he wanted to make a record of the extortion attempt. So he's like, well, we'll give you three screenplays for a million dollars and you can write three screenplays. And Rothman, um, Chandler's lawyer is like, no, that's way too low. We want 20 million. And then Pelicano comes back. OK, we'll give you one one screenplay for 300 grand. So he basically lowered the original author offer. And at that that point, Rothman's like Rothman and Chandler knew Pelicano was just pulling their string and he had no intent of negotiating anything. Um, and that's when and around the same time, that's when June's like, I want my son back. She went to court and she's like, I want my son back. And so the very next day, Chandler to, took Jordy to the psychologist, the one that they had gone to the month prior with the hypothetical scenario. And at that point, Jordy disclosed that he had been mol molested by Michael and the very next day, it was all over the global media. The police got in. It was just like a huge uproar. Um, right. You know, that Michael Jackson had molested this child or had been accused of molesting this child. And so what happened then, and so this is where I think people need to understand. So the police got involved and there was a criminal, they began a criminal investigation. But at the same time, Chandler filed a civil lawsuit against Michael for molesting his son. So that created two court cases simultaneously. Right. And one had absolutely nothing to do with the other. So you had a criminal case and you had a civil case. And so Michael's lawyers were like, what the F? Like, they're like, you can't have a civil case when there's a criminal investigation. You have to let the criminal investigation to complete first. Sure. Because they were trying to get Michael deposed in a civil case. So basically a deposition is where you have to you know, give testimony under oath as to where you were, when you were there, et cetera, et cetera. And Michael's lawyers are like, you can't have him give a civil deposition and say he was in, you know, in this, ta this town at this time and there at this place, et cetera, et cetera, because then the police can craft their criminal case around what he's already said under oath because you're basically forcing him to give everything away, his entire defense, you know, and letting them craft their criminal case around it. And that's not right. So they went to the judge four separate times and says, you have to delay the civil trial. You cannot, and you have to delay the civil deposition. You can't 
force our client to give a civil deposition when he's got the same matter pending in a criminal investigation. But then what Chandler's lawyers did is they um, filed a motion for trial preference and they asked for a civil trial within 120 days. So they wanted an expedited civil trial right away. Right. So you can see right there who's pushing for the criminal, Michael and his attorneys, who's pushing for the civil, Chandler and his attorneys. Mm -hmm. So that's really un important to understand right off the bat. It's, so it's not Michael's trying to buy his way out of prison. His lawyers are going to the judge over and over and over and saying, you have to stop the civil trial. We need to finish the criminal investigation, and then we can do a civil case. Right. So basically, the police can't find anything. There's, they can't find a single corroborating witness. They can't find any physical evidence. So they order a body search of Michael, where they basically photographed and videotaped like his private parts, which is you know really humiliating, demeaning, etc. And the they basically were trying to see if you know Jordy's description of Michael's private parts matched the photos and the videos they took. And the reason um, Chandler's lawyer had Jordy give a description is because he's like, well, Michael has vitiligo. Even if he guesses wrong where the blotches on his skin are, it doesn't matter because vitiligo changes every day. So the blotches are constantly moving around. So Chandler's lawyer was like, well, if he gets it right, that's great. If he gets it wrong, we've got an explanation, no big deal. But what they failed to recognize or where they they kind of made a mistake is Jordy told the police that Michael was circumcised, but Michael was not circumcised. So I don't think they anticipated that part of it. So we know that the description that Jordy gave did not match. We also know it did not match for other reasons. One, they did not arrest Michael. They would have arrested him if they had a match. Sure. Um, number two, they asked them that the photos be barred. Chandler's lawyers asked that the photos be barred from the civil trial. So there would be absolutely no reason for Chandler's lawyers to bar the photographs from the civil trial if there was a match. And then later when they had a grand jury, they asked Michael's mother if her son had surgery on his genitalia, which again implies there was no match because they wouldn't need to ask that question if there was a match. So now we're this this happened in like I think December, November, this strip search. And then by January, so Michael was set to be deposed on January 14th, and then they delayed it to January 25th, but they couldn't get it delayed any longer. So on January 25th, the morning of January 25th, his lawyer settled the civil case because they did not want their client giving a civil deposition in an ongoing criminal investigation. And there was $20 million paid out. It's not right. clear who paid it. I believe Michael's insurance company paid it. I know a representative from Trans Transamerica told the press that Transamerica did offer to make a payment to settle the case. And Michael did write in one of his later songs in history, insurance, where do your loyalties lie? Because it's not clear how keen he was on settling. He was being massively pressured by his lawyers, you know, who were telling him, you cannot get involved in the civil case when we've got a pending criminal matter for the same thing. And so that civil case was settled. And then in later that spring, the um, the criminal uh, investigation, they convened two grand juries, one in Santa Barbara and one in Los Angeles. And you know how they say, you know, a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. Well, mm -hmm. both grand juries refused to indict Michael Jackson. Wow. So, you know, that just tells you how little evidence they had against him, that not one but two grand juries refused to indict him. So that's basically the 1993 case in a nutshell. Um, and then later on, like Jordy en ended up emancipating himself from his parents. He didn't want anything to do with either of his parents. Um, and a lot of uh, friends of Jordy's have said over the years that, you know, Jordy to told them privately that Michael never molested him and that, you know, he'll never speak to his parents again because of what because of what they made him go through. And his mother testified in 2005 that she had not spoken to her son in 11 years. And one of the things about Evan Chandler, I think that that you know gives us a really good insight into him is you know when he said that the the impact of this all this on his son is irrelevant to him. I mean, I think that speaks volumes. And then of course he would commit suicide in in two thousand nine, correct? Yes, he actually committed suicide a few months after Michael's death. I don't know if there's any relation to that. Allegedly, he was sick with various illnesses, and that's why he committed suicide. Um, he he shot himself. Basically, I think he shot himself in the face or in the head. Um, but but Jordy uh, had a restraining order against him. Against yeah, Evan, right? so 
Yeah, because in the 2005 criminal trial, the prosecutors were trying to get Jordy to testify against Michael, and he refused. He would not testify against Michael. He even left the country. He's like, I'm not testifying against him. And then two months after Michael got acquitted, uh, Evan beat up his son with like a a dumbbell, and he like sprayed stuff in his eyes. And like he basically like physically attacked his son. It was pretty brutal. And then Jordy got a restraining order against his father. So I don't know if his father attacked him because Jordy refused to testify against Michael. Um, I don't know if it had anything to do with, you know, because the timing was very close to Michael's criminal case. So I don't know if that had anything to do with the attack or if it was unrelated. But yeah, the father did physically attack the son. And we will be right back. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Gracious Day Grains. Uh, Sean, you like to eat healthy, don't you? Always, buddy. I try to eat healthy as much as I can. Yeah. And there is nothing healthier than uh, what they call like farm to table, right? This, so when you when you can get something right from the ground and, and make it and then put it right on your table. Um, and Gracious Day Grains, they have a tremendous selection. It, and it's totally organic. Everything is... You know, they don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. They have um, a bunch of different uh, different products on their website, Gracious Day Grain. So if you go to graciousdaymilling.com, uh, you, you'll find a, a bunch of great stuff there, Sean. Yeah, you will, Billy. And, and it's owned by Tom Maxey, who's a, who's a great guy from Virginia. Um, he's a truth seeker, just like uh, me and you, buddy. And uh, Tom's growing philosophy follows the wisdom of farmers of centuries past and a quote from tom is if we practice the right rotations we exclude the bugs and weeds without needing herbicides or pesticides so i mean this is great billy i mean what he's doing is fantastic there's cornbread mix there's cornmeal popcorn he sells buckwheat pan sean have you had buckwheat pancakes no buddy oh my they're delicious i love buckwheat pancakes and they, and and gracious uh, gracious day grain sells buckwheat pancakes. Just go to their website, and and you know you'll be able to find all of this stuff there. You can order it right off the website. You can find out all about how they how they farm and, and their whole philosophy. Tom's philosophy is great stuff. It really is, Billy. And one of the things he does is he grinds small batches at, at very low temperatures, which retains the flavor and the freshness. Of course, and and it. I mean, you can't get any fresher than that. I mean, it's right literally right from the ground so again go to graciousdaymilling.com and just you know take a look on there you can order whatever you want and and they'll they'll send it right to your door i mean again it just it doesn't get any doesn't get any fresher than that right from tom's farm to your door to your table so absolutely and eat healthy eat healthy and you'll feel better absolutely i wish i could do that i wish i could eat healthier sean i well, start with Tom's stuff, buddy. I, I'm going to. I'm going to order some of those buckwheat pancakes. I love there making There you go. I'm going to try them too, Billy. Yeah, they're really good. All right. Gracious Day. We thank Gracious Day Grains for their sponsorship. Thank you. I think when you look at the settlement, you know, it's really there. You know, the settlement was like basically to protect uh, Michael, you know, and, and his right to to put on a defense in the, in the criminal uh case when you look at it oh absolutely yeah because actually when we get into the 2005 trial you'll see like once the police find an alibi they just change the dates on their charge sheet and that's exactly what they're trying to avoid they're trying to avoid you know giving all this information about michael so then they can craft their case around it i mean any lawyer would have given michael the same advice any half decent lawyer um, especially when the insurance company is paying it out. Um, but it does, from an image perspective, you know, the media just ran with it and said, you know, he bought his way out of prison, right. which is obviously right. patently false. Right. And the media remember, really steps up their attacks at this point. Oh, it, it was a circus. It was it was absolutely a circus. I mean, they were, they, he was convicted in the media with, without question. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. And then... Uh, the history album comes out shortly after this, right, Monica? Yeah. So he came out with, in response to these allegations, he came out with the history album, which is a very, very anti-establishment album. Like right. you can just feel the anger on that album. That's where he wrote the song about the JFK assassination. That's where he, the, he wrote, they don't care about us. 
he wrote the song money about how greed runs the world and you know and how the wars we fight are not for the reasons we claim but for their mm -hmm. for selfish reasons and and he wrote a song about the district attorney that had been going after him and in that song he said um they want my ass dead or alive you know he really tried to take me down by surprise i bet he missioned with the cia now i don't right. think michael had any evidence that the cia was was involved in the attempts to destroy him but the fact that he wrote those lyrics means that the thought crossed his mind sure you know and at least you know he thought it was a possibility um and yeah and there's just earth song is on that album as well which again is about you know just why are we destroying this planet both both from an environmental perspective and why are we destroying humanity you know why are we dropping bombs on children and etc. So it's just a, an incredible album. It's not the al type of album you'd ever expect to hear from a mainstream pop star um, because it really is a very, very anti-establishment album, a very, an album very critical of power, very critical of media, um, very critical of the criminal justice system, very critical of Hollywood. I mean, he's just, I think I quoted some uh, Charles Thompson, who is a, another um, investigative reporter that's co covered Michael's cases a lot. You know, he said he's just ripping the shits out of everyone on that on that album. And what what song was it where he said the truth lay at the grassy knoll? Oh, that was Tabloid Junkie. So that's the song he wrote and where he covers both the physical and character assassination of JFK. Okay. Um, yeah. And in that song, he says, truth be told, the grassy knoll, um, you know, which is basically, you know, implying because he's like. He's basically singing about, um, you know, he's like, uh, speculate to break the one you hate, circulate the lie you confiscate, assassinate and mutilate, you know, and then who's the next for you to resurrect? JFK, expose the CIA, truth be told, the grassy knoll. And then, you know, where he's so he's saying like the way I interpret it, because especially when you listen to the the song as a whole, the song is about media slander and media because he says like, you know, slander, you say it's not a sword, but with your pen, you torture men. Um, you know, this, the song is about media slander and, and whatnot. And, you know, and he's sort of implying, you know, you, they assassinated JFK, they mutilated him, mutilated his image, and they resurrected mm -hmm. him as something other than what he was. And then Michael's saying, well, the truth actually wow. lays at the grassy knoll. Um, wow. You know, and then in the second verse, he's like, shoot to kill, to blame him, if you will, if he dies, sympathize, you know, such false witnesses where he's saying basically, you know, because a lot of people did blame JFK for his death. And you can also interpret those lyrics as referring to Oswald because he says and beforehand frame him in the hood or something, um, it, whether he's talking about Oswald or JFK. But he's basically saying, you know, blame him for his death and then shed fake tears of sympathy, you know, like that's wow. all fake. Um, it's a really bold song. Like there's a lot there's a lot of lyrics like that on that album. Um, so he really goes there. Um, it's definitely not an album you expect to hear from a mainstream pop star and virtually nobody knows about these songs. It's kind of wild. I mean, they're incredible I, songs and nobody yeah. really knows about them. Yeah. I was um, going to say that Monica, they were not popular. I mean, they were not mainstream songs by, by any means. I mean, you know, I, I, most people probably never even heard these songs. Yeah, no, they haven't. And it's, um, and I think it's his magnum opus. I think it's his best album. Cause I think, it was just so raw. Like you could just feel the emotion and feel the like pain in his voice and the anger in his voice. It's, it's just such a raw album. Um, and it's such an honest album um, that I think is definitely his magnum opus. And it certainly didn't help him, you know, in terms of like, I think the media just went after him even more hardcore. Um, but you really have to admire that he did that. And I know JFK said, you know, the greatest duty of an artist is to remain true to himself and let the chips fall where they may, you know, cause JFK said, you know, art should not be a form of propaganda, but a form of truth. Right. And I think that's what Michael was trying to do with his art. And I think he did pay dearly for it. One of the amazing things in the book, and I, I didn't notice, but, but you mentioned how um, Michael tried to buy uh, Marvel before the, the movie explosion um, that they had written around 1999. Yes, he did. I think he had. Did a... you know that, Billy? I didn't. No, I didn't know that at all. I know he he wanted to be um, he wanted to be Spider Man or so. Did, didn't he? He wanted to be in in one of those movies originally, right? Yeah. 
he wanted to direct films later in life. He was really wanted to, um, that was one of his passions is directing films. And like, even when you look at his music videos, there are, some of them are quite long, like thrillers, like 15 minutes long. Um, you know, he called them short films. So he wanted to direct like long films, you know, like a two hour film or something that was, right. I think, always a, a, a goal and a vision of his. And I think he was very visionary in terms of um, just understanding where the money can be made in the industry. Like when he bought the Beatles catalog, you know, he made so much money off of that. And I think he recognized that if he bought Marvel, he'd make, you know, massive amounts of money off of that. And so he could see those things. I think he had a really keen eye for, um, you know, how to make money in the industry. And what ended up happening with that, Monica? I just fell through. I think they couldn't get the, they couldn't agree on a deal. Okay. And, and I then, know fairly recently too, I think uh, his, I think Paul McCartney bought back the the Beatles catalog. Didn't he from, from Michael's estate? I think that happened within the last few years. Uh, Sony did. So yeah, that's an interesting story because okay. Michael al always swore he would never sell it. Um, yeah. But then his estate sold it back to Sony. Oh, okay. Interesting. I thought it was McCartney. I thought he bought it. Maybe he got it from Sony, but I think his estate sold it to Sony. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. And then shortly after this, he and Michael would uh, marry uh, Elvis's daughter, Lisa Marie. Yes, that was around the album, the history album. Yeah, they okay. were married for like two years, but they dated for about eight years. So that about a couple of years before they were married, and they actually dated for about four years after they got divorced. Um, so they still spent time together. And the press was really hard on that relationship, too. I mean, they made all kind of accusations about it. Yes, they were. They were very hard on it. But that was definitely a very genuine relationship. Um, I think the second one, Debbie Rowe, she seemed more like... Um, to me, uh, like a surrogate, I don't, I don't think there was a romantic relationship there. Um, but with Lisa Marie Presley, that was definitely a genuine romantic relationship. And then around this time, the, the documentary comes out, right? That was basically a smear job. Yeah, it was in 2003. So, you know, Michael's image by this point was a complete mess. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't all just the media attacks. You know, I, there was like, I think the plastic surgery, there was the painkillers, um, which again, were from genuine physical ailments. And, you know, so none of this stuff helped him. So his image was a bit of a mess, you know, by the early 2000s. And so he wanted to do a documentary to sort sort of um, clarify things and sort of, um, you know, clean up his image or whatnot. But he was basically manipulated into participating in a hit job. So they essentially released this hit piece on him um, in 2003, it came out in early February 2003, but it was filmed in 2002. And in the documentary, um, you see Michael um, with this young boy, Gavin Arvizo. Um, Gavin Arvizo met Michael because he was in the same dance class as the son of Michael's hairstylist, and he had cancer. It was like a rare sort of cancer. He's still alive today. Um, and he basically begged or his family begged the um, hairstylist to introduce them to Michael and she introduced them to Michael. And so he invited them to, you know, spend some time at Neverland or whatnot. And and Michael wasn't even, um, cause they testified in court. Like when they came to visit Neverland, sometimes Michael told them he was not there, but they saw he was there. So he was kind of avoiding them. Um, so I think on, on some regards, he didn't get the best vibes from the family even early on, you know, but he had a big heart, you know, this kid had a cancer, you know, he, he felt bad for the kid or whatnot. And in the documentary, the kid tells a story how he and his brother asked Michael, you know, can we stay in your bedroom? And they're like, you know, they're like, please, please, can we stay in your bedroom? And, um, you know, and then Michael's like, yeah, that's fine. You can sleep on the, my bed. I'll sleep on the floor. And um, so in the documentary, they're basically saying like, you know, I shared a bed with my, or they sort of imply that they shared the bed, but they they didn't. Um, Michael and his um, assistant slept on the floor. Michael's kids were in the room. And then these two boys, the Gavin and his brother, slept in Michael's bed. And his assistant said that Michael asked him to sleep in the room because the kids were really pushy and he didn't understand. You know, he was kind of, you could tell he was kind of skeptical of them, but he, again, mm -hmm. he didn't really have the heart to tell this kid with cancer, like, no. So he's like, fine. Um so they kind of go through the story in the documentary. And so the media starts speculating 24 seven that Michael's molesting this child. Cause in the documentary, you also see Michael holding the child's hand. 
And it comes out later that Bashir asked, Bashir's the guy who did the documentary. He asked Michael to hold Gavin's hand while they were filming. And Michael was like, this is kind of weird, but whatever. Mm. He, he did what he asked them to do. So you can see Bashir's like setting this whole thing up. Um, and Michael was a bit, I think, gullible and naive. Like he, it was, I think, you know, people took advantage of him a lot. So essentially this documentary aired and it was just a total hit piece. And everyone starts speculating that Michael's molesting this child. The police start investigating if Michael's molesting this child. The Department of Children and Family Services start molesting, investigating if Michael's molesting this child. And the pre press is hounding the Arvizos. So they got in contact with Michael and, and basically asked, can we stay at Neverland for a few weeks until the press bombardment dies down? Because there's like, we can't even go, go out the door. They're everywhere. They're hounding us. And, and I, like I said, my, uh, Neverland's like 3,000 acres. It's got multiple guest cottages. So Michael was like, yeah, fine. You can stay at the ranch for a few weeks. And um, so what happened then is the, basically Michael's staff testified that their visas started to act entitled and, and were rude to the staff. And Michael kind of got sick of them and eventually asked them to leave his property by early March. So they were there from basically early February to early March. And then they left. And then they basically went to Feldman, the same civil attorney that um, Chandler used in 1993. So they went to the exact same lawyer and they wanted to file a civil lawsuit against Michael for, for molestation. But the lawyer, because what happened after the 1993 case is the California laws changed. So in 1993, you could have a civil and a criminal at the same time. But the laws changed so that the civil case could now be stayed until there was a uh, until the criminal investigation was complete so the because the police were after the documentary started investigating michael criminally for this alleged crime um they couldn't go forward with their civil case and so the lawyer told them you have to go through a criminal case first you cannot go through a civil case and so that's why there was a criminal case in uh 2005 otherwise they would have just done the same thing they did in 2000 uh, 1993 and I think the reason the grand jury indicted him in the latter case is because now for 10 years, the media had been telling everyone that Michael Jackson is a child molester. I think as I, you'll see the evidence is just absurd in the case, even probably more absurd than 1993. But I think because of that brainwashing by the media stories, mm -hmm. I think the grand jury, and it's now the second case, the grand jury was like, okay, we'll indict him. So he did get indicted um, on that. And initially when they indicted him, um, the boy claimed he was molested five times by Michael. And um, we'll see what time that changes. So they ran into a lot of issues between the indictment and the actual trial, which was in 2005. So the indictment was late 2003. The trial was started in early 2005. So the first problem they ran into is the police found a videotape. So Michael put out this rebuttal documentary to that hit piece to basically show all the... Because his... His own film guy was filming while Bashir was filming. So he wanted to show all the places where Bashir took comments out of context, et cetera. And they, they did put out this rebuttal documentary. And on February 20th of 2003, again, uh, the Arbizos were in, in at Neverland from about February 7th to maybe March 10th. So on February 20th, they filmed for that rebuttal documentary, although their their segment never never aired as part of the rebuttal documentary. And so, but the police found the videotape of their filming for the rebuttal documentary. And that videotape had not just their interview for that rebuttal documentary, but also all the in-between chit chat. And you can see like in that in-between chit chat and in their interview, they're praising Michael, they're making fun of Bashir. They're saying the insinuations that Bashir is making are absurd and ridiculous. Um, and this is really important because in their indictment, they said Michael molested Gavin from February 7th is when the molestation started. But this videotape is February 20th. So the police are like, crap, what are we going to do with this videotape? So what they decided to do is they added a conspiracy charge to kidnap and imprison their visas to Michael's charges. But they didn't oh, indict God. any of his alleged co-conspirators. They just added this charge to Michael's charges. So now basically they're saying... Well, he kidnapped this family, he imprisoned them, he forced them to make this videotape making fun of Bashir. Um, even though you can clearly see there's, it's like in between chit chat. Nobody's, this thing is not scripted at all, right? Right. So that was the first issue they came up with. So they had to add a kidnapping and, you know, imprisonment charge to his list of charges. But then they found out he had an ironclad alibi for the early parts of February. So they ran into another problem 
because they couldn't say he started molesting him from February 7th. So then they moved out the start date to after February 20th. So now the claim is basically that like, and you have to remember, this is all after the documentary aired. So the, the timeline they went to court with is that basically, you know, the entire world is speculating that Michael's molesting this child. The media is speculating. The police are investigating him. The Department of Children and Family Services are investigating him. He kidnaps and imprisons this family, forces them to tape a video making fun of this Bashir and praising Michael. And then for the very first time, he decides to start molesting this child. Like, he would literally have to be the dumbest criminal like in human history right. to do that. Right. 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 So, but that's the timeline they went to court with. And that's, and yeah. that's even the altered timeline. They, they've already made several changes to the timeline by the time they get to, to trial. Now, the other thing that changed is they indicted when they indicted him, the boy said he was molested five times. By the time they got to court, the boy claimed he was molested only twice. And that was because of the shortened time frame. I guess they couldn't claim five times, so they had to claim two times. Mm. You know, and one of the, the, I think the jury foreman said, you know, who doesn't know the difference between being molested five times and two times? Right. You know, so already right from the bat, this whole case is like really sketch. And then they get in, you, that's now we start to get into the credibility issues of their visas, which came out during the trial. Like they had sued JC Penny for 150 grand for sexual molestation, and they won that lawsuit, I think, because JC Penny just wanted them to go away. And I think they were hoping that would happen with Michael. He would just give them some money to go away. Hmm. Um, you know, they like tried to meet and like kind of swindle all these celebrities like Kobe Bryant and Jay Leno and George Lopez. Like when they were in George Lopez's home, Gavin left his wallet there and then uh, w w which had no money on it. And then his father called Lopez later saying, oh, my son left his wallet there. Let me pick it up. And he goes to pick it up and he said, my son had three hundred dollars in it. It's now missing. What did you do with the three hundred dollars? So they basically accuse Lopez of stealing from Gavin. Just, like he like, needs three hundred dollars. Right? Yeah, like the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and Lopez called him an extortionist to his face and. You know, they were just our visas were just really sketchy. They were having like fundraisers, even though they had insurance for Gavin's cancer. And um, they just had a really, you know, sorted background. And that whole case, like um, I go into detail in the book, but um, it, it should have never been like he should have never been indicted. It should have never gone to court. And and when the police found the video, when they found the ironclad alibi, they should have dropped the charges instead of changing Absolutely. the timeline and changing the amount of times he was molested. But I think the important lesson is none of this was talked about in the media. Some of the RVs are credibility right. stuff was like, I remember the JC Penny thing they talked about in the media, but the timeline was never explained. The changes mm. in the charges were never explained. And I think if people had understood that, I think nobody would have taken that trial seriously. Right. And one of the things in the, when you talked about that documentary hit piece, it kind of brought me back to Jim Garrison uh, because there was a hit piece on him where, Right. When he was interviewed and he was asked how many how many shooters do you think were in Dealey Plaza? And I think he answered three. And then they asked him another question of how many people do you think have prior knowledge? And he ended up saying like twenty five or something like that. And then when they spliced the tape and they they asked him the question and, and put it together, he said, you know, they asked him how many shooters were there in Dealey Plaza and he put the answer twenty five and made him look like a, a whack job, like there's twenty five shooters in Dealey Plaza. I mean so the, that that's what I was thinking about as soon as you said about that hit piece. It's it's amazing how some people just take these a lot of these documentaries like they're gospel, and you see how so unscrupulous some of them are. Yeah, and there, and there was that, that documentary just a few years ago on HBO, right? That uh, leaving oh, Neverland. That's yeah. That's that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> so yeah, yeah there we, was we, a. We, we okay, go ahead. Another, no, I was just gonna say maybe we talk about that another time. Huh? I don't know, Sean. If you're, if we're, if we're good, or yeah, I mean, we could go on a little bit. I, I we are yeah. a little pressed for time, Monica. I know we kept you mm -hmm. a while, but um, do you want to do you want to end with that trial, and then we got to talk. We got to go in. Uh, you know, we got to talk a little bit about the the death of Michael Jackson too. Yeah, sure. And it, yeah, I I think that's good for the trial. What we already did. Okay, and then Michael. And before we even get to his death, though, he. He was really traumatized at this point with the people calling him, you know, a child molester and, and stuff like this. Could you talk about that a little bit, how it really was 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 really affecting him really bad? 
Yeah, no, he was definitely very traumatized. Um, you know, like if someone would yell, you know, if he was out in public and someone would would yell child molester, you know, his bodyguard said he would just go and like sulk in his room for a week and just completely shut down. And, you know, and so they would lie to him when they could and say, no, we didn't hear anything. We think you misheard that. Like, you know, because they knew how emotionally it drained him to be falsely accused. And there's actually... You know, there's a lot of studies done on um, it's just sort of the psychological impact on people who are falsely accused because it's sort of, you know, you're really on your own. Um, and I think one of these organizations kind of compared it to bereavement, except for when you're bereaving, you know, everybody's supporting you. you you're, you're going through this massive loss, but you have all this support, whereas when you're falsely accused, you're going through this massive loss, but you have very little support, um, right. you know, and so I think... It was just, it was very, very emotionally like traumatic for him, the whole experience. Well, not only right. did he not have support, Monica, he was being attacked everywhere. I mean, there were, yep. Chris Rock was doing jokes about it. It was, you know, it was just everywhere. The media was, it was all over the, you know, it was just, and every time there was an article, you know, he was wacko Jacko and, you know, the, the post, New York Post had it all the time. I mean, it was just constantly attacks on him. Yeah, it was brutal. I, I don't know how any human being could withstand that, to be honest. Well, there's always seems to be an element in in this country when you, they see somebody down, they they like to kick them. You know, they just they, instead of trying to find out the truth or try to help the person, they, there's a certain element that just loves to pile on and make it worse. Yeah, no, it's a it's a sad kind of reflection of our society. I think. I agree. So then. You know, the, the, we get to the, the death of Michael Jackson and, and his doctor, Conrad Murray, he, he was treating him for insomnia, correct? Yes, that's correct. So Michael um, had trouble sleeping his whole life. Um, he had a really active mind, like he was very creative. He couldn't sh shut his mind off. That had a lot to do with it. I think also the stress of just how he was portrayed in the press and everything sure. had a part to do with it. Um, and so he was preparing for these concerts in London and he just, you know, when he performs his adrenaline level is so high that he can't go to sleep after it takes him a couple of days for his adrenaline, adrenaline levels to calm down. And he's in rehearsal every day. He's performing. He can't sleep. He did reach out to like a holistic healthcare practitioner initially to try to find like natural ways to sleep, but it just wasn't working. Like nothing was working. And finally he, um, ended up taking propofol with Dr. Murray, which was a tragic mistake because propofol was anesthesia and it makes you feel really rested, um, but it's not giving you any of the biological needs of sleep. So it's like eating something um, that might have calories, but it, you're not getting any nutrition from it. Uh, or you might feel full, you know, but you're not nourished. And so that's kind of how I guess I would compare it, or that's how a sleep expert kind of described it in one, one of the court cases. Um, and so he wasn't getting genuine sleep. It was kind of, um, you know, he was losing weight as a result of it. You know, he wasn't feeling well. He was getting like flu-like symptoms. Um, and I think he realized it because, so this uh, nurse, uh, holistic healthcare practitioner kind of castigated him and told him, don't do this. It's a really bad idea. It has horrible side effects. And then in the last few days of his life, um, he reached out to her for help and he wanted to see her. So I think he was having second thoughts. He realized he'd made a mistake and he needed to find some other way to sleep. Um, but she was out of town and it would take her a few days. She was going to see him on June 25th, actually, which is the day he died. And on the morning of June 25th, the day she was supposed to see him, he ended up dying um, of uh, from basically, you know, he didn't wake up from the propofol. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of sketchiness around that murder uh, or death. I shouldn't say murder. I don't know if it was a murder, um, but around his death. And, um, you know, Cur Conrad Murray did go to prison for involuntary manslaughter. That was the right. doctor. Right. Um, so he did, was sentenced to four years in prison. He served two and then was released on parole um, because he didn't call 911. He waited like half an hour to call 911. All the doctors that testified at that trial said that Michael would have lived if he would have just called 911. Um, so I don't know why he didn't call 911 if he was just panicking or whatnot. Um, there's just a lot of sketchiness around that death. Uh, again, I don't know if it was accident or murder. I, I know his right. family 
thinks he was murdered or some of his family think he was murdered. I will say, I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, it's not in my book at all. Um, that Puff Daddy or P Diddy lawsuit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that his security guy was Michael's head of security at the time of Michael's death. Um, and he wasn't the, the, he wasn't Michael's like long-term security. They they gave mm -hmm. Michael this other security that I don't think he really wanted. He wanted his other security there with him. And so that is an interesting, because he's the wow. one that the, he's the one, he's the one that the healthcare practitioner talked to. And she's like, I'll be there in a few days to help him. And then suddenly he's dead. I don't know. The whole thing is just strange. Wow. Um, I don't go into that in my book. Cause obviously I didn't know about the P Diddy lawsuit and sure. that he was involved in all that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's also you're playing with fire when you're taking a drug that that's strong. So, right. you know, it very well could have just been a horrific accident. You know, we don't know, um, you know, what happened there. But it does seem like he was trying to get off it. That's my impression, because you don't usually reach out for help from someone who's castigated you unless you realize that someone was right. 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 And we talked to, we just talked to Jim DiEugenio. We had an episode where we talked about Marilyn Monroe and, and he talked about how the doctors, you know, should have been looked at for, you know, all the, the prescriptions they were given to Marilyn and the, the right. amount of drugs that she had in her body was incredible. And, um, you know, at that time they really didn't look into the doctors at all. And, and he referenced, you know, later on with the, the Michael Jackson case. Yeah. Right. With Conrad Murray. Remember that Billy? Right. Yep. He did. Oh, interesting. I'll have to go back and listen to that. Yeah. Well, we, I don't think we don't have it. Uh... Yeah, it's not published yet. Mike. Oh, okay. We just we interviewed him last week. So it'll probably yeah. be, it'll be out before this episode when this episode yeah. is aired. Yeah. Okay, I'll out. definitely I'll definitely give that a listen. Yeah, I have but a that long was on a hit piece that Brad Pitt um, promoted uh, on Marilyn. Yeah, uh, Netflix, I saw that so... movie. It was horrid. Or horrible, horrible. Yeah. One of the reviewers called it a, a hate letter to Marilyn and Right. And that's pretty much what it was. It, it was awful. So we we debunked that. But um, yeah, this was great. I know we took up a lot of your time, Monica. Um, you know, is there anything else you want to add that we didn't talk about? You know, because I know after the death, you know, Bill referenced that HBO documentary, you know, the media continues to slam Michael. And more accusations came out after his death that, that didn't add up. And of course, the media never scrutinized any of those, correct? Yeah, so I have a chapter in my book on that documentary, that hit piece, and kind of debu debunking yeah, it's been it. Debunked. Yeah, that's yeah. been several things have come out to, but of course they don't get the publicity. Correct. You know, yeah, the doc, that the original documentary gets. So talk about the Monica. Talk about the quote that that Michael said to Kevin Dorsey. The I'm trying to think exactly what he said, but about, he basically uh, said, "Yeah, they don't want me to live long." Is that the right. one you're he talking said, about? Take a look yeah. at history or something. He said, "Take a look at history." Yeah, he said, or he said to Dorsey, you know, I'm not going to live long. They right. don't want me to live long. Just look at history. You know, I bring too much unity to the world, too much love, too much and peace. They don't I want that. Earlier, the the people who do that, the people who try to unite everybody and try to bring peace, always some horrific happens to them. Yeah, yeah. His his story is both very sad and very inspiring. I think. I mean, it's very sad because he Agreed. went through hell. But it's very inspiring because he remained authentic. And like JFK said, that's that's the main duty of an artist to stay authentic. Well, this book was a real eye opener for me because I, I didn't know a lot about about the case. You know, I just basically knew what the media was saying. And of course, I'm always skeptical of what the media says to begin with. But I really didn't look into it much myself. And, um, you know, this book convinces me at least that, you know, the evidence doesn't add up. The, the accusations don't add up. And and you have to ask that question, you know, whether this was some kind of intel operation to discredit Michael Jackson. We don't know. And we don't know, you know, if his death was was murder or if it was, the, you know, the doctor, you know, was convicted of manslaughter. So we don't know, you know, there. But I mean, I, I'm convinced at least, you know, that that the accusations against Michael, um, you know, were unfounded and, and untrue. And and that's what I came away with, with from your book, Monica. Yeah, nothing. I'm glad. I hope people, you know, come away with, you know, just one that those allegations were not true. But I hope they also um, rediscover his music and the music later in his life and just how beautiful it was. And I think a lot of people don't have an awareness of that music. And I hope that, you know, it inspires them to want to go and listen to it. 
Yeah, well, it's a, it's a tremendous book, and we have it up on our our bookshop, and and people could I recommend everybody purchase it, and it's just it's just a great book, Monica. It's right up there with your JFK book. Thank you. Yeah, it's called Michael Jackson, the Man, the Music, the Controversy. <clears throat> Excuse me, Monica Wiesack. We thank you so much for for coming on. We always love when you come on the show, Monica. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you're, you're a great guest each time. <laughs> oh my God! Excuse me. Yeah, right, right there, Billy. I'll make it. I'll make it. <laughs> well, thank you. I enjoy being on. It's always really fun to chat with you guys. Well, All hope right. we can get you back, Monica. We love oh, to definitely. have you come back. Definitely right. sounds good. All right, great. Well, thank you so much again. All right, Sean. Another great episode. Um, and we will see everybody next time. And that's enough out of you. Good night, everybody. All right. That's Enough Out of You podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken, LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken, LLC is prohibited. So don't even try it.